Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, we're gonna go over something really cool, which is Wireshark hacking for absolute idiot gremlin babies. And my name is Cody Kinsey. Today, we have our absolute idiot gremlin baby here, Michael. <laughs> and we're going to be starting out using Wireshark from the perspective of a beginner and see what it's useful for, as well as actually going and doing a little bit of Wi-Fi hacking with it and seeing what it can really do. Michael, are you excited? I'm so excited to be a baby grandma. Let's not do that voice ever. <laughs> okay, so um, Michael, how much do you know about Wireshark? Um, basically, it's a program that captures like packets as they're going across the network, and then you can potentially use it. Like if you had like a, a handshake and all the encryption stuff, you could like decrypt packets and analyze them and like look at like oh this this. Uh, Target device is going to like this net, uh, this website. You could potentially like steal passwords depending on whether or not it's using like HTTPS. How would you explain Wireshark to your grandma? Mm, it's a wiretap. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So Wireshark is basically like a wiretap. Only we're looking at Ethernet connections as well as wireless connections. So this also applies to other types of signals. You can look at Bluetooth signals and other sorts oh, really? of interesting mm -hmm. stuff in Wireshark. Yeah, it's really, really modular. Mm -hmm. I've seen people looking at like communications from satellites. Do you uh, have to have Wireshark. like special hardware for that, like an SDR and like uh, UberTooth Well, or be, think of it this way. Wireshark is a way of interpreting tons of different protocols that are mm -hmm. used uh, for wireless communication. So gotcha. whatever you need to gather that wireless communication, that's the hardware that you need. Okay. And once you bring it into Wireshark, then there you go. So my laptop computer has a wireless network adapter that's compatible with Kali Linux, as well as this other, I'm using today a Panda wireless network adapter, which is the ones we used to use before Alpha Wireless sent us a big goodie bag of compatible ones, which in my opinion are a little bit higher quality. But Panda wireless stuff works pretty well because the chipsets that it's based on are really well supported by Kali Linux. So if you're looking to get started with Wi-Fi hacking stuff, and if you don't have this ThinkPad that has a compatible uh, wireless network adapter, then you can always just grab a really cheap wireless network adapter to go along with it. And we recommend Alpha Wireless, but if you want to check out Panda Wireless, they're pretty good as well. And, and when you say compatible, what you're talking about is supporting monitor mode, correct? Yes. So um, what I mean by that is not every wireless network adapter has the capability of going into monitor mode. We're looking for ones that have the mm -hmm. correct chipset to interface with the driver that's supported in Kali Linux. And at the end of that, we get the ability to put this into a mode where it listens to everything not just what is being broadcast for the specific device on the specific network. Mm -hmm. Now, the average wireless network adapter is created to be able to allow a one-on-one -on -one conversation between you and the router. But other network adapters are able to be put into this special mode that allows them to listen to everything. So if you're stuck with a wireless network adapter that doesn't support this, then you are basically stuck only listening to traffic that is meant for you or mm -hmm. at least on the same network. Yeah, yeah. Monitor mode is pretty powerful. So like that's how you capture the handshakes and everything. Right, and well, that's how you capture all the packets. And yeah. handshakes are just one example okay. of a useful packet that we can capture. But today we're gonna go way beyond that and we're gonna start taking a look at what happens when we're spying on a wireless network from the outside. And then mm -hmm. we're gonna show how versatile Wireshark is by actually trying to break into the wireless network uh, and try to see what's going on inside of it. So we we'll, okay. would hopefully be able to see maybe some passwords, something right. like that. Um, and so this is like the post-exploitation, like this is, Okay, I've gotten a password. Now what exactly can I do with all that? Well, we're going to start even further back. So we're going to start from the perspective start from the perspective that we don't have um, a password to this network, and we're going to try mm -hmm. to actually break into the network and then start using Wireshark to start observing packets. So we're going to start on the outside. Okay. We're going to grab try to use another program to break the password to the network, get in, and then we'll put that password into Wireshark and hopefully be able to decrypt communications that are happening between other devices on the network. So that's pretty advanced, okay. but we're basically peeling back a layer of security mm -hmm. and directly monitoring as though we were on an open Wi-Fi network and we were able to see everything in plain text. Now you say this is pretty advanced, like what skills or, or what requirements do I need to meet to like be able to perform an attack like this? Not th I mean, you need Wireshark and a compatible wireless network adapter and maybe 15 minutes of time. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe not that advanced. Yeah. So 
Um, when I say advanced, this is a fairly advanced use of Wireshark. It's usually used as kind of a one-off tool when you're investigating something. Yeah. Some people live and breathe Wireshark, and it is truly incredible when you really take it to its fullest level. Mm -hmm. But for people that are just casually using this, this might be a little bit above and beyond what they've done with it before. So hopefully I'll be able to go over some useful ways that you can get into Wireshark, see what's going on, and actually make some use of what's there. Um, Wireshark, I, when I talk about you know wireless reconnaissance and stuff, and signals intelligence, we get into things like Kismet and mm -hmm. Wiggle Wi-Fi and some of the other offshoots that provide different windows into uh, the wireless environment around you. But I think that um, really for inclusiveness and the ability to drill down into data, Wireshark is by far the most advanced tool. And I really advise that anybody who has the time and opportunity to learn it, take a look at it and just, yeah, uh, I've been able to do my own research with it. The output format is able to be put into things like Jupyter Notebook to do analysis. So a lot of the things I've recorded in Wireshark later go on, later go on into projects in Jupyter Notebook to enrich the data and basically pull information out. So it's a really powerful mm -hmm. research tool, and it's also a great hacking tool, which is what we're yeah. going to explore. Yeah, today. I was going to say, I, I think I've even played around with it for like the API reversing kind of stuff that we've done previous mm -hmm. live streams on, because you can, when you're analyzing those packets, see like what... Uh, requests are going back and forth and that can help reveal like what's under the hood for an app or something like that. Yeah, and a really good beginner exercise is basically proxying yourself or, or basically right. like sitting in the middle of your traffic and just looking at everything that's going through. Mm -hmm. If you're able to make it so that you're sniffing communications, um, some of this also like can be amplified by techniques on the network like doing some ARP, uh, ARP spoofing yeah. and then going through the traffic once you're doing that so all traffic is flowing through you. Um, so ARP spoofing is when you're emulating the router, right? Right. So if we really wanted to get in the absolute middle of this network, what we would do is we would get in and then we would start ARP spoofing and telling everything mm -hmm. on the network that we are the router and they have to send the traffic to us, when in fact we are basically receiving the traffic, editing it maybe, or at least observing mm -hmm. it, and then sending it on to its destination. So it's a sneaky way of sitting in between the router and everybody else who's trying to communicate on the network and using that trusted position to peel back some of the um, some, of the, some of the communication that's going on. And, and what about like SSL and other forms of encryption like that? Is there any way to like uh, bypass like those encryption schemes or like get you can around try them? to downgrade it, yeah. um, which is a valid way of attempting to to down, you know get around SSL. But SSL generally makes things a lot harder. Mm -hmm. uh, although my advice is just you know if you can redirect someone based on DNS queries, you can see where people are querying um, via DNS. So that means that you can see where they're going, if not exactly mm -hmm. what they're doing. So that gives the opportunity for you to just you know redirect yeah. them to a, a phishing site of this that looks like the same gotcha. thing. And you can even throw up a quick SSL certificate for that website. So if they're not paying attention, they'll have no way of being able to tell that they're on a fake version of that website. Okay. And, and now with DNS, though, like you're only really seeing the website. You're not seeing the exact page on that website that they're going to, right? Right. We're seeing where they're going, but not the contents of their communication. So it's more like metadata. But it okay. gives us enough for us to target them so that we know the next time they request that website, for example, we could serve up a fake version and just redirect um, where DNS says that website is located. That sounds pretty nifty. Yeah, it's really cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So as I said, you'll need a, a Kali Linux compatible wireless network adapter, or at least one that you know can be put into monitor mode. Um, it's really useful mm -hmm. if it's Kali Linux supported, and there's lots of resources out there for you to find the right chipsets. Generally, the way this works is there's a chipset inside uh, that basically um, determines the way it's going to interact with anything you plug it into. So if you have a good chipset that's well supported and able to be put into monitor mode, uh, the individual model of this wireless network adapter generally doesn't matter too much, provided that it has a good chipset inside of it. So mm -hmm. we've done a separate live stream, which I don't think is on our YouTube, but is on our Periscope and Twitch, yeah, it's one of the first where Periscope we crashed video. a Kali Linux computer by testing out a bunch of random wireless network adapters from the internet. So if you want to see us trying out a bunch of these for their compatibility, uh, yeah, the results were uh, surprising. In fact, mm -hmm. one of them, I think, is an exploit in and of itself, just by how quickly it's able to crash computers. So, all right, let's go ahead and switch to, actually, Michael, let's switch to your computer. Get okay. off of my Google. Yeah. There we go. All right, so here we have Michael running Wireshark. And Michael, do you have any idea what's going on right now? Um, yes, there's a long stream of information of which I barely understand half of it. Like, I, I uh, kind of, like, I know this is like, uh, like the uh, Wi-Fi and LAN, like, protocol, protocol like, the mm -hmm. way, it, like, but I don't really know what that affects. Um, SSID is like the network name. Um, 
length i'm assuming is just like how how big the packet is that's uh, yeah source i think in time i just saw google starbucks <laughs> We are nowhere near us. I know that trick. We're nowhere near a Starbucks. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. Um, Maybe it's probing. Um, but basically, oh, no, it was otherwise, probing. Okay. So I don't what, really know what's going on. So I, looking at the screen, I'm getting all sorts of information because I understand what's going on. And I can see that on the info part, which is on the, the right side, you can see it tells you about what type of packet it is. Right. So I can see, oh, weird. There's Oh, so a probe is like when it's like, hey, is this network around? Yep. So yeah. there's a, a device around here that's... Um, <laughs> Probing for Google Starbucks, I think. Uh, and then there's also... I wonder whose device that could I be. Wonder, I wonder whose it is. Uh, and then there's also a bunch of different um, networks that are nearby mm. that are advertising lots of different beacons per second even, saying, hey, I'm here, I'm available to connect to. And, and didn't you actually do some research previously on how you could like identify uh, people's devices by um, spamming those fake like beacons yes so we did that in another one of our live streams we actually used wireshark to record uh the unmasking of nearby devices by creating a ton of fake networks that appeared to be really common open networks and recording mm. which ones nearby devices were attempting to connect to because they automatically recognize them having connected to them before so that was another really interesting use now here i'm going to take your mouse um okay. if we go up to tools and, and wireless we can see wlan traffic and we get a lot of information about our wireless and okay. about our wireless environment here. We can see if we organize stuff by um, we can do it by SSID. Um, we can see the number of packets we've received. So overwhelmingly, the packets are from this network. Yeah. Percentage of retries, the number of beacons total, which be and then the number of data packets. So we can see this mm -hmm. is by far the most active network. Someone is on it. Um, and to me, as a hacker, I'm like, oh, data packets. That means someone is using this right. network currently. I can see probe requests. I can see, oh, so I can see, if I want to see the number of probe requests, I can see somebody is probing relentlessly for Google Starbucks. That's okay. I know when it says uh, right, uh, right under here, uh, broadcast, does that mean like that is a hidden network? Or... No, so on the left, you see that MAC address, the f -f 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 yeah. that's, uh, that's broadcast. So if you're sending a message on uh, like over Wi Fi to just all Fs, that's sending it to everybody. That's a broadcast message. Okay, gotcha. So, so what's the purpose of that? Like, so a broadcast message is basically a way that a um, it, it's a way that nearby devices will address anybody in range. Mm -hmm. So that's basically saying, hey, is anybody in range um, have does anybody in range have a Wi-Fi network respond here? And that way they are hoping to get back a directed okay. uh, request that gotcha. says, hey, I'm here. Here are my capabilities, and they can connect. Yeah, and, and and is that where this would come in? The like. A broadcast, but with a specific MAC address. Yeah, yeah. So if uh, on the, in this case, it looks like um, two different devices were sending um, packets to just broadcast, which is you know anything, just uh, all Fs. And uh, yeah, they sent a packet, and then there was another retry. It looks like it never made it there. <laughs> uh, but you okay. can see, yeah, so you can see basic information about. The MAC addresses that sent it. Again, this could even be the same device if it's changing its MAC address. Right. This just gives us the perspective to know, OK, what is it calling for? And here we can see that there's some device calling for a MicroPython network, um, and that also it looks like it, it's probably changing its MAC address. Mm -hmm. Or So either there's a bunch of different, oh, in fact, it's probably my phone. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a MicroPython network that I have to cr connect to in order to do MicroPython stuff. So since I've connected to this in the past, it looks like my phone is repeatedly sending out uh, probe requests nice. uh, in order. Yeah, you can see yeah probe oh no probe hey. responses. So that means that um, something is responding as this network nearby. So basically, uh, yeah, th that's an indication that something's calling out for this network and then it's being responded to. Cool. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you might notice though, if you were to dive into this a little deeper, is that everything is on the same channel. And there's a reason for this. So we can click on any of these packets uh, that we're interested in, and we can scroll up, we can scroll mm -hmm. down. Um, here's the, the thing that like lets us pin to the bottom, so we can always um, see when things are being updated. But if I wanted to check out, uh, let's see, just a beacon frame here, I can double click it. I can see the entire thing. I can expand it. Um, I can see that in the tag parameters, that's where it says my spectrum Wi-Fi. I can expand that further. Um, but if I go into the details from the 8211 radio information, I can see everything is on channel one, and I can verify this by right. Oops, no, down here. 
I can go to the same area here, right mouse click on the channel, um, apply as filter, select it, or no, sorry, okay. apply as column, and now I can see that everything okay. is on channel one. So why is it on? Because aren't there uh, like 12 to 14 channels for Wi-Fi? Yes. Or at least 2.4? Yes, there are. So, all right, so this is a lot of information. We basically got this running. Everything's on the same channel. We can mm -hmm. see data, we're, but we're on the outside of the network. So we're basically just taking a look at nearby networks, assessing what's going on between devices and networks, seeing who's connected to who. All this is really useful information for a hacker. But we're also restricted a little bit because we're only able to listen on one channel. And that's because Wireshark doesn't really have the ability to manipulate the wireless network adapter. Mm -hmm. It's not really what it's for. So instead, we're using another program, in this case, AeroDump NG, to change the channel of the adapter. And we can tell it to either go to every channel and skip around so we get a little sample of everything in the okay. immediate area, or we can set it on a specific channel like we have it now to just listen there. Oh, and so is that like why, um, I forget the guy that made it, but like the Wi-Fi cactus, where they have like mm. multiple uh, adapters so that they can Get Basically, all never have to skip around. Yes, yeah. so you have just enough to be able to listen on every channel. I believe the next year they tried to do every five gigahertz channel as well, and the device was very hot. Yeah, I hear it. I uh, got like terabytes of data in like minutes. Yeah, that's it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know where they saved it all. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and switch over to my screen, and I'm going to take this wireless network adapter and plug it in, and we're going to start from scratch. Um, uh, hopefully, if we can see it. Oh. Mm -hmm. If, Are you plugged in? Yeah, I'm plugged in. Oh, wait. Wrong button. <laughs> wrong button. <laughs> yeah, that's your screen. Yeah. Oh, no, wait. Is that my screen? No, that's your screen, bro. Oh, wait. One. Yeah, there we go. There, Get back uh, to my Yes. Game. All right, sorry. Okay. I couldn't tell the difference between three and one for a second. Okay, so we're going to go to our terminal window. I'll make this a bit larger. And I'm going to type I have config. And I now have this new wireless network adapter plugged in. It's WLAN 1. I'm going to put it into monitor mode. So, And again, this is super, super easy on Kali Linux. If you're doing this in Ubuntu, you have to install some stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to install Wireshark. You have to install NetTools, you, oh, in our case, because the wireless network adapter kept going down. And you have to install Aircrack and G. And once you have those three things, then you're able to do this. OK, so wait. Explain why we need all three. So things. we need uh, we need Wireshark because we're looking at Wireshark. Right, right. We need Aircrack NG because we need to put our wireless network adapter okay. into monitor mode, and we need uh, Net Tools because it contains IF config, and I cannot remember how to bring up a wireless network adapter that's down in IW config or IPA right now. <laughs> so I'm just using that. So in Let's order to fully follow around. along, okay. that's what you would need. Gotcha. Um, I I know there's a way to do it in IPA. I know there's a way to do it. I'm sure there's some sysadmins watching. Like in the comments, uh, please let us know. Just remind me what that is. But um, I know there's a way to put the card into monitor mode and do all that stuff in IW config. That's a more modern uh, tool that Kali wants you to use. But I'm just attached to um, I'm just attached to IF config. It's nice. So all right. So let's put this into monitor mode. Airmon ng start wlan. One, and we can see this chipset is pretty well supported, um, so we should be fine. If I do ifconfig again or IPA, I can see that WLAN one mon is now the name of the adapter because it's in monitor mode. And if I do iwconfig, I get another view as well. We can see um, that right now uh, it says power management off. I'm curious to see if I type ifconfig. No, it does show up. OK, so sometimes this won't show up. And if you need to do that, uh, if you need to bring it back up, you mm -hmm. can type ifconfig wlan uh, one mon up, and it should bring it back up. So now I'm going to do Wireshark. And that's the simplest command ever. <laughs> there you go. And in Wireshark, I have a bunch of different interfaces. But this is the one I'm interested in. And if I begin capturing on it, then I should be able Wait, to Wait, did... there's a dark mode for this? I need dark mode enabled. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so here we go. Um, we're seeing just probe requests. We're not really seeing any anything else, which is a little bit curious. So what's up with that? Well, for one, uh, we're probably on a different channel. So if I look at the 8211 information, I can see I'm on channel 10. And if I'm going to add this as a column. So if it, if you wanted to skip around, you need to do that in Aircrack NG then? That's right. Well, um, arrow dump ng or air, yeah, arrow dump ng. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to apply this as a column. 
and we can see, yeah, everything's on channel 10. And guess what? The party is not on channel 10. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's some stuff going on, but it looks very boring. It's basically my phone and, uh, this laptop calling out for networks that it has, uh, joined before. Now that's not useless. If I wanted to, I could probably trick things into connecting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a hacker, if I want to just use this information to, you know, try to create a network and get these, um, get these wayward devices to try to connect, then that should work just fine. But let's say that we want to step this up and actually see everything. Um, I'm going to go back to my terminal and I am going to split my terminal horizontally because it looks cool. And then here I'm going to run arrow dump ng. I'll make it bigger. No, it's not saying. A little tiny. ng wlan one mon. So I'm addressing that wireless network card. And now I'm going to put it into what, what channel do I want to do? Um, actually none. Let's, let's scan everything. Yeah. So now it's skipping around, it's showing all this stuff. And if I go back to Wireshark, then guess what? Six, channel one, channel eight, channel three. I'm Wait, starting. And, and so Wireshark's automatically interfacing with it? I, I, I was, or did you have to do a special command? Uh, no, no, uh, Wireshark, the, the interface was already open okay. and running. So we can manipulate the interface without bringing Wireshark down, it's all fine. Um, uh, if we bring if we bring the interface down, then Wireshark is going to be confused and we'll, won't have anything to, to bring in, but. Yeah, no, okay, yeah. So I can, so basically I'm connected to two different networks here. I'm connected to the network that I have permission to join and I can see traffic on. And I'm also, uh, I, I'm also not just on the outside uh, using this wireless card where I'm just looking at stuff around me. So if I want to actually go after a network, well, that's not too difficult to do. So I'm going to, on my phone, just go ahead and create a Wi-Fi network, uh, which I just did. And it's going to be called testnet. So let's say that we're a hacker. We're starting from scratch. We want to identify this network testnet. And we're going to look around. And we see that there's also beacon frames. So there's a bunch of different ways we can start hunting. First, we can start using filters to make our search easier. So if we click here, I can see, if I bring this up, that there's a lot of different information I can expand. Mm -hmm. And one of them is probably going to be the name of this network. So if I type. Uh, so filtered like uh, by SSID. That's what I'm thinking. So yeah. here we can see tag, SSS, uh, SSID parameter set. So let's expand this. We can see, uh, yeah, SSID um, and then this right here. So let's right mouse click, apply as filter, and select it. And now mm -hmm. let's just try, the, try to change this to testnet. OK, so in the top bar there, you can start setting the parameters up there. If, right, so if the you top just bar, to remember it all. Yeah, so the top bar is basically um, our uh, display filter. Okay. So the display filter allows us to make either a single or compound expressions that let us filter the information to be to make mm -hmm. more sense. And here we're trying to figure out, you know, what channel is this operating on? And it's pretty definitively now we can see channel six. And it looks like it's peeking over to channel seven. But if we really want to start like zeroing in on this network, then we can do it on channel mm -hmm. six. So I'm going to in aircrack ng or airmon or no arrow dump ng press control c go back up add dash c six and we should now see dramatically more packets from our target because we're going to be not skipping around anymore. So let me go down to the bottom. Um, come on down to the bottom. Uh, yeah, so we're seeing more packets. And the reason we're seeing more packets is because we're locked on the channel that this is broadcasting on. Mm -hmm. So instead of just kind of getting a sample of everything that's going on and missing a lot of packets from this network, we're now locked on and we're watching this one particular network. Mm -hmm. So, OK, um, there's other ways we can watch this network as well. If we've decided that this is what the network we want to watch, let's say that we want to watch all traffic going in or out of this network. We can use the filters to do that. So if we look here, we can see some information about this device. We can see um, the frequency, the signal strength, which we've done. I think we've done another live stream on using the signal strength to create a graph mm -hmm. so we can track stuff down. Um, we Then we have the receiver uh, receiver address, which is broadcast. Yeah. That's uh, just... I was going to say that like, signal strength alone is a useful feature. Like if you're setting up like Wi-Fi in your house or whatever, and you want multiple access points, not like overlap channels and stuff. Right. So yeah, so let's say that we, we get down here and we also see the transmitter and the source address, which is usually the same, but not always, as someone pointed out in the comments. So we're going to take the transmitter address in this case. 
We're going to right mouse click and apply as filter. So that's just like the MAC address of the uh, access point then? Or, or the device transmitting? Yes, so now we're seeing all traffic coming from this MAC address, meaning we're seeing all traffic coming from um, this access point. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a bunch of beacons. Well, and we'll see anything else now too. So before we were just looking for beacons. Now we're looking for all traffic, but we're still missing half of what we're doing here because we're only seeing traffic that's going out. What about traffic that's coming in? Hmm. Yeah. What do we what do we do, Michael? Uh, we search for the MAC address associated with that. Well, what we can do is first we can make a compound statement. So um, we can do or, and then um, we can take this and basically flip it using a single character. So here, oh. if we go and put DA, that means destination address. So then if we're saying okay. both the transmitter address and the destination address, then what that should mean is that we're looking for basically everything so coming anything out coming... and anything yeah, yeah, coming okay. in. So we're looking for anything addressed to this network from an outside device, and we're also looking for anything that is uh, coming out from it. So both both ways we should now be able to see. That's pretty cool how you can just like do that really quickly from the bar. Is there like anywhere you can like help command or anything where you can see all the commands that you can use it's, as filters? I'm sure. Well, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of good write-ups on this, um, okay. FAQs, whatever else, but I find that like it's kind of hard to find these. Right. And um, what I do is I just click around. I right mouse click on something and then I'll set it as a filter and then I'll just be like, oh cool, like this, you know, this is exactly what I was looking for. Right. Um, and so then basically play around with just it. Just basically until you play around with it, set filters for. by right mouse clicking on values, and then when you see them, manipulate them and see if you can make them more useful. Mm -hmm. For example, I have a couple saved ones that only will try to match the first half of the MAC address. So I can identify devices by manufacturer by looking for you know the same yeah. string of the first half of the MAC address, and that allows me to make a list of maybe only Apple devices that okay. are broadcasting. Which so it's very, very flexible the way that you can use this. Yeah. And I really, really like the way it does that. So if I want to add another condition. I was going to say, I like how easy this is to get uh, up and running. But then also, it seems like it has a bit of a steep learning curve because you have to have like a lot of intrinsic network knowledge to really take advantage of some of these advanced filters and such. Right. So uh oh, there's nothing. And that's because I What did you do? You broke it, Cody. Yeah, so I added an and. <gasps> and that and is actually providing a, a, a logic gate now that's saying, okay, it has to be to or from this access point, but it also needs to be an ePoll packet, which, do you know what an ePoll packet is? No, that's the kind of intrinsic knowledge I was talking about. A what? Uh, a just like knowledge of networking. Oh yeah, so that's a handshake. Okay. Do you know what a handshake is? Yes, I know what a handshake is, but I don't yeah. have a fancy name for a handshake. All right, so I'm going to attempt to connect to this network now with my other wireless card. Um, I still, I hate that there's a micro Python device down here and I intend to find it. Um, so we're going to connect to more networks, testnet. And as we connect, I'll need to put in a password of some sort. Uh, I don't know. Um, and let's see what happens. So if I've set this up right, then hopefully, mm -hmm. yeah, there we go. Look at Ooh. that. <laughs> I just captured a handshake. And that's a lot of packets. Yeah, so you can also oh, see that it has messages one, one two, three, four, and, and four, and then it looks like it's so this is that four-way four handshake. This is the four-way handshake. Okay. But if we were to save this right now, then it actually wouldn't be enough to crack this pan this password. Do you know why? Hmm, I don't know. So the it reason seems like we have all four. Um, is there another half of it? So not not quite. So. I'm going to remember this expression, but basically, um, I also need to get a beacon. So the way that SSIDs, or the way that um, these uh, handshakes work is that it takes the SSID of the network, so the network name, uh -huh. combines it with like the MAC address, and then like through some formula comes up with this really long number. So we actually need all of that information in order to pull off an attack against okay. the password. So if we go back... And we actually have that information there. We're just filtering it out right now. Right, exactly. So if I go back to this command, um, then I have like all the stuff that's going in and out of our target network. Okay, great. Um, if I click on it, I can see that there's other ways I can set a filter. So let, let me just collapse some of this. Um, all right, so 802.11 radio information. Mm, nope, that's not what I want. Uh, IEEE. -E -E. All right, so we can see it's a beacon frame. And this is what we can use to filter. So I'll apply it as filter, selected. And this is the other thing we can use. So now if I were to put in our previous expression. Oh my god, that's getting long. Yeah. 
um, or whoa all right so what is this okay, monster expression doing yeah so let's walk through this so if we're saying we want to see anything to or from this mac address which is mm -hmm. our target access point and it has to be either an epoll so either a handshake or it has to be a uh a beacon frame so that's everything we should need in order to crack this handshake and if i scroll through so. it looks like all pretty much beacons uh, and I'm hoping that somewhere nestled amongst, yes, here, nestled amongst these beacons is the precious handshake. So what, if I am going to save this now, so let me stop this capture. I'm going to press file, um, export specified packets. Oh. I'm okay. going to select the displayed packets and, and so I'm going to make this make feel like PCAP. Or... I'm going to handshake demo one, I guess. Uh, I'm going to save that not in root. I'm going to save it on the desktop. Where is it? Desktop. I'm going to save it here as, and I have a bunch of different options. I can save it as a PCAP PNG. I'm going to save it as a PCAP. Oh. Um, so what's PCAP? Just packet capture? Yep, a packet capture file. I can do a modified TCP dump, whatever. I'm just going to save it as this. So we'll save it as a PCAP file. Um, handshake demo onepcap and then I'm going to open up my terminal window again. I think I already have it nicely mm -hmm. split here. Um, OK, so let's stop this. I can see I also got a handshake here, but it knows. Um, but I, I wasn't saving yeah, it, so that's Is okay. there a reason you might want to use Wireshark to capture a handshake over something like Aircrack? Uh, yeah, it's more nuanced. It's it's basically like it's capable of doing all of this stuff, whereas Aircrack NG um, or Aerodump NG is, is basically designed to do one exact specific okay. thing. So if you, this just comes up in the course of something else you're doing and you happen to see that there's handshakes going out, you can capture them in Wireshark, see that they're valuable, and export them and run them the exact same way. So it's just a much more powerful okay. tool. OK, gotcha. Um, so let's do arrow dump. Well, first, let me ls. Arrow dump ng. Oh, no, sorry, arrow crack ng. So you could pretty easily like take a Raspberry Pi or something like that, stick one of these network adapters on them, and then like just leave it somewhere to capture all the packets. Uh, going through a network. Yeah, you could. So I'm going to use this password list. Let's see. And let's see if this works. Oh, that worked so <laughs> fast that I, OK. Well, that didn't take much time at all, did it? Best <laughs> password ever. OK, so we were able to get the password almost instantly. Admittedly, I didn't use a very long password list. Mm. Um, if I look at the other ones we have, let's do Rocky. That'll at least like you know run for a minute. Uh, but I, mean, I think password one two three is like really close to the top. We of get a list. little bit of drama. Yeah. Okay. See, we got three. We got we got we some got point zero two percent of the way through the, the list. list. Yeah. Okay. So it's not maybe the best password ever. You might want to change that if that's your passwords. But we used Wireshark to get the information we needed, and we exported it with the beacon frames so that we could run this successfully. Because if you just export the handshake, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take this to the next level. We now have the password, which is password one two three. Um, what can we do uh, in Wireshark to take a peek into a network that we're not actually a part of? So if I press start again, I'm going to continue. So shark fin is start. Yep, shark fin is start. I'm going to continue I'm continue without saving. We're still on the outside of this network mm -hmm. looking in. So if I go to um, settings, or actually uh, preferences, I think. Where is it? Right? Maybe I have to stop to do preferences. Uh, I'm just going to stop. Uh, preferences, no, 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 options, no, merge, file set, wait, where are preferences? Edit preferences? So essentially what you're doing is logging in. Preferences is the, the last one. What? No, I'm Control not. Shift P. Yeah. I am not logging into the, into the network at all. No. Okay. I am absolutely not. So this will not leave any science on the network. I am basically Ooh. decrypting packets on the fly. So no. OK, so basically, no. if you if if you want to think of it in different terms, it's like people are sending mail back and forth, and you're like intercepting the mail, opening it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So no one knows that, oh, hey, you man in, man in the middle of this. All right, so here we can see protocols. Um, and there are a lot of protocols that are supported by, <laughs> by Wireshark. 
and scrolling through, most of them do not look familiar at all. Yeah, what, so, what, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so we're looking at tons and tons and tons of protocols. So I'm going to type in I, and what we're looking for is, I believe, I, E, 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 yes, A to 211. And this is where all the Wi-Fi options mm -hmm. are. So we can see um, reassemble fragmented datagrams, ignore vendor specific blah, call, blah, 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 blah. We don't really care about this. Um, ignore the protection bit, no. Um, enable a WPA key override, don't know what that is. Now what's this? Enable decryption. That sounds uh, exciting. Right, so if we click on edit encryption keys, um, we can see that there's none here. Okay, so. A sad state of affairs. Can you just like input? Password one two three, or do you have to like? So encrypt? I click on uh, the plus button. Yep. It'll give me options, and then there's three different ones: WEP key, a WPA password, and then a WPA PSK. Now the WPA PSK works best, I find, and there's a couple of different ways you can calculate this. I don't know why Wireshark doesn't just calculate it for you. It's mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's some extension that does. I don't know. There's websites that will do it. So if you just type the password into the website, it'll give you the PSK with the SSID. In our case, let's try the um, PWD. Um, this may work, it may not. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had it not work in the past, but I've also had it work in the past. So here's right, password one, two, three. Password. Yep. Yeah. Press OK. Press OK. And then now it should be attempting to match, um, to, or basically it should be attempting to decrypt packets that are going to or from this network. So I'm yep. going to remove these filters. Yeah, I was gonna so say we're it. back to looking at everything that's going through. And then I'm going to go back to the bottom. Um, is there a good way to distinguish which ones oh, are wait, encrypted me... and which ones are decrypted? Continue without saving. All right, so now we're up and running. We've got our new settings in place, um, and we are listening in. So, all right, so yes, we will begin to see like HTTP and stuff like mm. that. That is a sign of something that's unencrypted. So there's mm. still something that we're missing. Now, we need to be able to capture the session key, and that means that we need to have someone actually connect to the network while we're listening. So that's where we might use a more aggressive tool like um, the deauthor or something, the deauthor or, or something like that, to actually kick somebody off the network and cause them to momentarily disconnect mm -hmm. and then reconnect. And if we can capture that exchange, then we should have enough information to start to look inside what is actually going on in the network. And, and so you can do this retroactively. Like if I if I left the somewhere and captured like files or packets all day long, and then eventually cracked a password. Right, yeah, so this can be, this can definitely be done passively. Um, there's no need to do this, you know, uh, like aggressively if you don't want to. As soon as you grab the right information just by lurking around, you can actually get and start looking at it. So mm -hmm. let me see if I can find any HTTP information. Um, and if you don't find any HTTP information, it's generally a sign that you might have a problem um, when we have something like this. So I'm going to go to an HTTP website, mydougal.com. Uh, mydougal.info is not a real page. Cool. Type some stuff in, continue A, and then I'm going to verify also that I'm on testnet. Yes, I am. What am I looking at? <laughs> um, this is a shout out to our viewer um, from France. Uh, yes, day delay, it didn't work. So let's look in Wireshark. We're still not seeing anything. And this could be a result of uh, a lot of things. One of them mm -hmm. is the PSK might be a better thing to put in at this point. Right. So uh, if I want to do... And so you were saying the PSK is just like that hashed... Uh, it's like the password with the MAC address and the SSID all combined together. Yeah, Wireshark literally has a PSK generator on their website, but like not on... Mm, that seems a little silly. Password123... Test nets generate PSK. Come on. Oh, stop it. No script. <laughs> Just let it Silly do Silly no script. Making my life harder. Okay, look at this animation. Boop, 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 boop. Powering up. Okay, that's the PSK. It's long, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. okay. So now we're going to go here. We're going to uh, go to preferences again. I'm sure there's some fancy math stuff going on there. Yeah. Well, it's just a hash of those things. So we go to protocols again. We go through this giant long list to I E E E E E E E E E A to 2.11. And then when we go into the decryption keys, let's add one and just say, if you didn't figure that one out, then here it's this. Isn't it called I triple E? I added some extra ones for Panache. Look, boom, there we go. That was it. Nice. So now that's where we can see like the Git 
request and the put and HTTP. Sure can. So suddenly we can see all the stuff that was yeah. previously encrypted. Um, because we managed to get as soon as the device joined, we were able to see that. Um, yeah, and to be clear, you're not connected to this at all. So like if I were on this network, I would not be aware at all that you were um, looking at this information. Yeah, so I can start to see HTTP information. I can dig into it and see what was transferred. Mm -hmm. Hypertext transfer protocol. What did, It just says, OK. Hmm. How boring. But I can see headers, I can see like other information, um, and I can start to even see the websites that someone's going to. So I can probably also see, if I just get rid of these filters uh, entirely, then we can just see like what's going on over the network. So let's try um, going to, what's some random website? MyDoogle.com. <laughs> you really like MyDoogle.com. See if we can load it. And we're able to get some information. So I see some HTTP stuff. Actually, now I want to see it again. Do you have anything? Continuation, response. OK, what about DNS? Oh. So if we type in DNS, then we can see DNS requests. And this is probably mm -hmm. the most revealing, because we can see right now uh, that lots of stuff is going on. Um, we see our previous, uh, hey, Rubicon project. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know a guy that works there. OK, so we're just being served very aggressive ads, the Rubicon project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this is we can just... see a beacon is being sent to Walmart.com. Okay. Uh, yeah, so a lot of this is just information that's being loaded as we go to the oh mydoogle.com. See, mm -hmm. so if I let's um let's see if we can drill down and then start looking for specific instances of websites. I actually yeah. haven't done that before, but why not, right? I was gonna say this is a clear demonstration in my mind of why everyone needs uh, DNS over HTTPS. Oh, absolutely! Give all that shit to Cloudflare. They deserve it. Give <laughs> all of your privacy to Cloudflare. Definitely give every single I'm byte of data to a third-party vendor that's never gonna sell it. I'm sure, yeah. or have a breach. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if you're not using their service, like it's like a standard, though, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you could encrypt this data with HTTPS, like, I don't see the law there. All right, apply as filter, selected. What is this? DNS query name mydoogle.com. So we can see all DNS query results for mydoogle.com. So this is like this is a lot. We've gone from totally mm -hmm. outside the network to getting the network password to breaking right. into the network. And now we, as an attacker, on the outside of this network, we're not mm -hmm. doing ARP spoofing, nothing. We're just like watching on the outside and decrypting on the fly. We can see this stuff. So let's say that I want to go, I want to trigger any time that I see someone going to um, mydoogle.info, the notorious other website. So currently, <laughs> there's nothing, right? No one's going to go to that website. It's not real. Um, but if I go to mydoogle.info, God, I hope this is child appropriate. Nothing there, but we can see that somebody was trying. OK. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Right? So we can monitor in real time what's going on mm -hmm. this way. And if we want to, we can also see, for yeah. example, what's going on in the background. So um, do you happen to have your phone with you? Uh, yes. Okay. So if you want to see, this is probably one of my favorite examples. Um, go ahead and just connect to uh, testnet. The password is, as you know, password123. I'm going to put DNS. And let's take a look at some of what happens when we have a mobile device connected. And I think that this is a great way for anybody who's interested in privacy to be able to take a look at if they were connected to, let's say, just a, a Starbucks network, something like that, mm -hmm. exactly what's happening. Uh, because this is also something that could be happening on your network if you don't have a strong password. Okay, I'm on testnet. OK, cool. Looking up different infos on the app. Uh, OK, uh, let's see if I go down. Is this all the way? Seems like it's still moving. And I'm not seeing it. Yep, here we go. Um, so it looks like I don't see you. Are you mm. using a VPN? Uh, yes, I am. There you go. Okay. No, wait, no, I, I, I think I am, yeah, because uh, Google Fi, my carrier, uh, has uh, built in VPN. Oh, yes. Give all your information to Google. The yeah. best VPN of all time, Google. Um, network tool. No, wait, no. Uh, and, yeah. No, I don't think I have a VPN on, actually. Interesting. Interesting. OK. So uh, uh, I can try another app. Yeah, uh, try it. Or just try it. Honestly, we should be seeing some stuff resolving. Yeah, I'm connected to test that. Um, just for giggles, I'll turn off my mobile data. Um, what's a nice app to open? Flight radar. 
anything. Yeah, I mean, if this was uh, properly connected, or if we were seeing, I mean, if I go to flightwriter.com. Yeah. You know. I was also opening uh, Dark Sky, which is like a weather app. We're going to see all sorts of stuff. Oh, look, it moved temporarily. Oh, we're actually, <laughs> we're even seeing the response. I misspelled it, didn't I? Yeah, you definitely. Yeah, I oh, no, it. it's Flight Radar 24, sorry. Oh, that's really funny. It's just like, yeah. please, give us $10,000. But I can see that my, re my response small has moved temporarily and all this other stuff. But so this that's the difference between you know having someone connect and being able to get their mm -hmm. session key and read all that stuff and someone who um, is using a VPN perhaps, or yeah. otherwise, uh, yeah, isn't uh, just exposing all their data. So if okay. I were to throw on a VPN, start yeah. using Tor or something like that, then I would be able to actually evade this. But I could also, right. you know, um, start looking for Tor packets and identify that somebody maybe was on yeah. the network using. And, and I think this is a pertinent point to reiterate that like all of this you should only do with networks that you have permission to, because this, would be highly illegal if you were doing it on a the network. The only part of this that's illegal is cracking the password. If really? You want, yeah, if you know the password to a Wi-Fi network and you want to start sniffing away, it is absolutely legal in the United States, as far as I know. Hmm. Um, if you live in some... We are not lawyers. We're not giving we're, legal advice. I'm you. not a lawyer, but I will tell you that it's perfectly fine to do. Um, if you're in the United States, you are allowed to sniff, uh, passively sniff, meaning you're not joining the network, you're just detecting and decrypting packets. I mean, why would it be illegal? You know, yeah. if... Packets are going out over the airwave. If you grab them and mm -hmm. just work, well, work some math on them. I was going to say, business like, is that. if you're passively recording this too, isn't this like how um, like uh, shopping malls and stuff will like track you to the store by tracking your um, signal strength from multiple locations? Yes. And logging can, that over time, you can track a device pretty accurately with just some, some simple triangulation. So one thing I also want to go through is just, uh, you can also take a look at once you're inside the network, resolved addresses. Um, so we can see different ports that were resolved. We can see a host that were resolved. Um, it's it's a really, wait, hold on. why is it not showing anything? Um, we can see endpoints. I want to see protocol hierarchy conversations. Um, so here we can see conversations that were going on between different websites. Mm -hmm. um, oh wait, am I still running? I think maybe I can't run. I think maybe I can't do this while it's still running. Mm -hmm. Let me press stop. So statistics, capture file properties, uh, resolved addresses. Is it going to populate now? Hmm. Hmm. Statistics. Uh, IO graph. Oh, this is actually useful when we're running. This is how we were able to uh, determine spikes and signals. So we would be able to generate graphs from pretty much any data mm -hmm. there. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a lot, a lot of features that you could spend a lot of time. Oh my gosh, like there's so much. Here we go, to... up at the top. All right, so here we can see a list of IPv4 conversations. So we can go okay. back, we can see back and forth. Uh, oh, and also there's something on here that, um, where is it? There's an ability to resolve um, IP addresses, which I think is great, but you should be aware that it will attempt to resolve those. So like it might so send a you, request to, to actually you, do you that. You just like figure out the website name? Or? Yeah, so like it'll actually show you where a particular connection was made to because it will actually go and resolve these domains. So I'm not actually 100% sure. Come on, name resolution. It seems um, to be grayed out for some reason. Yeah, I don't know why. But uh, I still think it's really cool that you can go through and see, you know, okay, like what was someone resolving to? What's the mm -hmm. most common IP addresses that were resolved to? You can see address A, address B, and these are all the conversations that were recorded. Uh, so for anybody that's digging into these sorts of conversations, I think that's super cool. And you can also expand the type that are included by going through oh, this menu. Oh, wow. Oh, you, you can actually look at, that's uh, Zigbee. Oh, okay. So Bluetooth, you can, Zigbee, yeah. all, that, all that fun stuff. So that would be interesting to look at like a smart home network or something with Zigbee and Z-Wave and see like what's going on. on. Definitely. Definitely. And I'm a little disappointed that it's not resolving um, the the names because I find that so funny. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and close this one. I was going to say, we may actually have to uh, explore some of the further features in the future. Yeah. How much time do we have left? Are we, uh, we are 50 minutes in. Wow. Okay. So this is one last one I'll get back to. The WLAN traffic, I think, is probably the most interesting. From the outside perspective, uh, you can very quickly see 
what devices are requesting. So if there's a particular mm -hmm. network nearby device that really want to join, you can see which networks are the most popular. And you can also see when they're being used and how much. So as I said earlier, you can also take any of this data and turn it into a graph. You can turn it mm -hmm. into a filter. And I think that that's really cool. So Wireshark is a great way to be able to get around your wireless environment, both by identifying a network you want to listen in on. And then if you know the password or if it's an open Wi-Fi network, actually be able to see the contents of communications mm -hmm. and do a lot of interesting stuff there. Cool. Yeah. So what do you think about Wireshark now? I mean, I think it's really powerful. Like I said a couple of times, so like it definitely seems the kind of thing like you can you can lose yourself in if you don't know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely like have a question in mind or just have a lot of free time when you're going in to like spend looking around. I think it's like the kind of thing that you should if you're if you wanting to get into Wi-Fi hacking, it's definitely something you need to learn. Uh, but it's definitely probably something you should take a weekend and sit down with some like test networks and just explore. And that might and then maybe, you know, watch some of these types of videos and that'll help give you a like guiding star. Yeah, and we didn't get into some more advanced examples, but other things we can do is, for example, if someone was watching a webcam on this network, we would be able to, provided the connection they were watching it over it was using HTTP, actually oh. see the images in real time and download them yeah. using Wireshark. So this isn't just doing things like you know watching on the outside of the network. We can analyze protocols in detail, identify protocols of interest like JPEGs or mm -hmm. HTTP data that we can read in plain text, and then actually download these files or videos even as they're being streamed. Oh, so, so if you had like a surveillance network on the the same Wi-Fi or uh, Ethernet network, then you could potentially eavesdrop on that. Yes, absolutely. So if you have somebody streaming to like a like an interface that's showing the feed of the camera, that's some and that, real movie hacker stuff. It is. It is. So being yeah, being able to look over the shoulder of someone and see these images, I think, is really really cool. Mm -hmm. But you have to take the steps that we did today, which is first identify the network you're interested in, then actually grab the handshake, which can just be kicking back and waiting for someone to connect cracking the password, putting the information into Wireshark, making sure you're decrypting with the PSK. And then as soon as you have that accomplished, listening for the individual session key of someone connecting and recording everything and decrypting it from there on. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of kind of things you have to do to get to the point where you can see absolutely everything going on in the network. And there's, of course, still carve outs where you can't see stuff that's protected by SSL and you can't see stuff that's protected right. with a VPN. But aside from that, it still gives you access to things like uh, DNS that will tell you where the person is going. So if I wanted to fire up BetterCap, I now have all the information about where the traffic of the network is going already. And I can start selectively redirecting certain websites and popping up phishing versions of the same pages. Right. I, I was going to say, um, if y'all are interested in us like doing some of the SSL downgrading or like exploring some of these other advanced features that Cody is talking about, let us know in the comments. That way we uh, know which episode you'll want to see. Definitely. I don't know how to do that, but I'd have to figure it out. If you yeah, no, no. I, I mean, it, so. it sounds really interesting to me because I, I do. Obviously, there's a trend towards SSL and HTTPS everywhere. So like at, at some point, these sorts of attacks are going to stop working unless there's other attacks on those. No. No, I won't. you don't think? No, because like if I don't want to mess with SSL, I just redirect someone away from the SSL website to a fake website that has SSL, and no one's gonna like go and like look at the SSL numbers and figure out that it's like yeah. different. Like, Interesting. It, there's yeah. ways around SSL, and like if I know you're going to you know Google.com as all of us do, then I probably would be able yeah. to even if it's using SSL, just pop up a fake version of Google.com, redirect you to that one, and then provided yeah. it has the lock and doesn't give you a warning. How would you know the difference? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So like it would be that would be a fun episode even is like how you can man in the middle. So like you're basically taking the information from the target and then passing it through to the real website, but presenting yourself as the, the legitimate website. Oh, yeah, that's a more advanced attack. And our friend Ian did that one. Time, yeah. So maybe we could call on him to show it off. But yeah, there's definitely more advanced ways of doing that that bypass SSL by just taking you to a fake version of the web page rather than actually trying to attack the math behind the encryption because mm -hmm. it's pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. All right. So that's all we have for this episode. Another big thank you to Veronis for making sure this series continues on. And if you're interested in other free resources by Veronis, you should check out the AD PowerShell workshop, which is a great way to get started scripting in PowerShell for Active Directory, mm -hmm. as well as some of our cyber attack labs. Uh, we like, even did a live stream on the attack lab. Recently. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah. We even adapted one of the attack labs for a live stream. So if you want to check mm -hmm. that out, take a look at our live stream on attacking Windows systems and uh, cracking Kerberos tickets in order to basically do a bunch of bad stuff while pretending to be a backup system, which right. is pretty cool. 
So yeah, thank you, Michael, for joining us today. I mm -hmm. uh, hope everyone enjoyed this introduction to Wireshark and all the great stuff it can do. And uh, make sure to follow me on Twitter at Cody Kinsey and let me know if you have any other ideas for the show because I'd love to hear feedback and I'd love to hear new ideas. Cool. Mm -hmm. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.